We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's panel. Uh, this is Level Up, Methods for Localizing Digital Policy and Norms. Um, it's a pleasure to see you all. My name is Daniel O'Malley. I am the Digital uh, Governance Specialist at the Center for International Media Assistance in Washington, D.C., and it will be my honor to serve as your moderator today um, for this panel, which has been organized by the Open Internet for Democracy Initiative, a project co-led by my organization, SEMA, the National Democratic Institute, and the Center for International uh, Private Enterprise. Uh, today, what we're gonna be talking about is, I think we all know that the era of an entirely unregulated digital space, that kind of wild, wild west of the internet from the 1990s is over. Societies around the world uh, are coming to conclusion that digital governance is important. But the question then is, what does that look like? Um, and while we want to respect a global internet that connects everyone around the world, how do we do that in a way that takes into account different local particularities and how we do, do that in a way that upholds human rights standards and also can foster democratic societies. Um, so that is, that is the broad topic of question today. And uh, I'm pleased to be joined by a, just an excellent panel of experts who I am, I'm briefly going to, to introduce in just a second. But first, I want to explain how this uh, session is going to work. Uh, I'm going to give some brief introductions so you know who these experts are. Then we're going to engage in a moderated discussion. So I have some questions that I'm going to be posing to our panelists. Uh, they'll answer. I'm going to ask them to keep their remarks brief, three to four minutes, so that we can hear from everyone. Um, and I'm also asking them to engage in, with each other when they, when they uh, see fit. And then we'll wrap up with a, a Q&A um, portion. So for those of you who are per, per participating either in person in Poland or virtually here in Zoom, please make sure to uh, have those uh, questions in mind and we will get to you. Uh, Morgan Frost, uh, who is on this call, is going to be our digital monitor. So she will also be making sure that any questions are asked. So without further ado, I'm going to, to introduce our, our panelists. We're very pleased to have Marushka Chokobar uh, from the government of Peru. Marushka is the government and digital transformation secretary. In this capacity, she, she serves as the leader of the country's digital transformation process. Uh, she's a promoter of the digital government law, the declaration of national interest of digital government, innovation, and the digital econ economy with a territorial approach. Um, she was instrumental in the publication of the study of digital government in Peru by the OECD and the creation of the Government and Digital Transportation Lab Laboratory, as well as the creation of the National Dig Digital Trans Transformation System and the establishment of the Digital Trust Framework. Um, obviously, she's done a lot, and we're just really pleased to have a government representative on this panel. Um, so thank you for joining us, Marushka. Um, and also, I really love your background. Machu Picchu. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Olga uh, Kiriluk, who has a PhD in international law and is currently a program manager at the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative in charge of uh, regional internet freedom advocacy. She is also a chair of CDIG, Southeastern European Dialogue on Internet Governance, and she's a founder and advisor of the Influencer Platform, a Ukrainian-based think and do tech. She's actively involved in regional and international internet governance and human rights initiatives. She's a founding member of the Internet Freedom Network uh, for Eastern Central Europe and Eurasia. She's uh, the Europe representative at the Executive Committee of Non-Commercial Users a Constituency, NCUC, at, the, at ICANN. And she's a former open internet leader with the Open Internet for Democracy Initiative. And she also, in her spare time, which I don't know how she has any, also provides consultancy and expert support to, to Freedom House, the Council of Europe, and a range of other international companies 
uh, working on these topics worldwide. So thank you for, for joining us in person in Poland, uh, Olga. Uh, then we have, um, I believe, actually, I'm, I'm trying to see if Sheila Bergen has managed to join us. Um, she may, uh, from Kenya, she may not have made it. I'm gonna go ahead and read her bio just on the off chance that she is able to connect. Um, Sheila is the country lead of uh, innovation at UK's KTN Global Alliance Africa. She has 12 years of experience in supporting startups, building innovation ecosystems and convening stakeholders in the technology industry across Africa. She was in the founding board of the first and the first vice chair of the Association of Startups and SME Enablers of Kenya. She is in the Africa Innovation Policy Task Force, as well as the supervisory board of the Global Innovation uh, Gathering Network. Uh, she's been involved in drafting of startup acts in several African countries, including her home country of Kenya. And last but not least is Richard Wingfield. R Richard is head of legal at Global Partners Digital where he oversees the organization's legal policy and research function, building the organization's understanding of the application of international law to internet and digital policy, developing its policy positions and monitoring trends and developments across the world. Richard also oversees GPD's engagement in key legislative and legal processes at the national, regional, and global levels, as well as its engagement with the tech sector. So, um, Again, it's a real pleasure to have all of the, the panelists with us here. Um, and I wanna kick things off by, um, I'm gonna ask actually uh, Marushka, you know, um, you, one of the things that we wanna talk about is when we're talking about these digital policies, uh, whether it's around privacy protection and GDPR, we've seen a number of countries, you know, implement uh, privacy protections. Content moderation is an area of global regulation that many countries are, are now trying to develop digital policies. But my question um, for you actually, Marushka, is you know, are there prior experiences of digital policy localization in Peru? And then how did the government manage that? Thanks, Daniel. First of all, I would like to thank the Internet Governance Forums for the opportunity to present the Peruvian perspective on these very relevant matters and an increasingly digital world. In this end, I would like to comment that we, when we talk about the localization of digital policy, we need to focus on cultural diversity, geographical challenges, vulnerability situations, and diverse conditions that exist in our territories. Peru is a country with more than 32 million people, a huge con challenge in connectivity, and more than 3 million Quechua-speaking citizens. Therefore, the first step to advance in territorial digital policies has been to improve the digital governance in the country. Today, we have an enabling regulatory framework and an active digital ecosystem in all regions of, of our, our country. The second step uh, on this road has been the recognition of the real needs for digital inclusion in the Peruvian territory and the identification of leading social actors in, the eco in this ecosystem that allow joint effort to accelerate the closing of gaps. In this context, uh, it should be added that the importance of the localization of digital policies is based in the strengthening of democracy, because the access to the digital environment and its opportunity are important critical factors to guarantee that the voice of all citizens is heard. Seen from, from this perspective, it is also essential to recognize that uh, the leadership of social and political actors and the groups that represent the voice of the most vulnerable population. Combining the digital access and the opportunity for participation of local actors, we can clearly establish a line to fulfill the commitments of the states and society and the coverage the needs of citizens at national level. In Peru, we recently approved a general government policy that established as a central axis to guarantee inclusive access to the digital environment and the use of digital technologies and data to benefit of citizens in all regions of the country. This policy considers and respects the condition of vulnerability, 
cultural diversity, native language, geographic challenges, and the condition of disability. Under this objective, it is important to analyze the challenge of internet access because it has expanded to scope of forum where people can freely share their ideas, but also fake news and hate speeches. These are the concerns of legislators. However, the regulation that is based only on an international principles do not fit to local needs. Therefore, any type of digital regulation or policy that is not discussed with a multi-stakeholders approach could put digital rights at risk. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Mariska. It's really interesting to hear about, you know, the, the power of multi-stakeholderism, especially in a multicultural country with a lot of different needs and societies. Um, I'm really pleased that Sheila has been able to join us. It's, it wouldn't be a, a virtual uh, IGF session without some technical issues, right? Um, but Sheila, that, that actually the, the, the next question is coming for you and that is, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, what are some examples of, you know, these global policy norms, be it around privacy, be it around content regulation, platforms, you know what ex experiences have you seen in your and from your perspective in in Kenya or in, in East Africa around that process and, and what does it look like? Do you have a specific example you want to share with us? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, apologies for coming in late. Somehow I couldn't I couldn't get in. So, but I'm really really happy to be here. Thank, thanks again. Um, I think I've seen a number of. Uh, uh, approaches. Uh, first of all, I think in, in Africa and I think globally, there's a replication of uh, policies based on, um, I think it's the, just the, the, the global shift um, and interest in, in privacy, um, in, in creating better uh, digital environment and, and for communities and individuals. So you, we are seeing a lot of uh, countries copying each other, obviously, in, um, in the policies that, uh, in, 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 for instance, in data uh, protection laws, in uh, cyber security laws. Uh, now we are seeing um, digital tax laws. Uh, we are seeing uh, startup act laws. So there are a number of, of these laws that a lot of countries um, uh, copying each other or, or um, global standards in, in, in that case. I think the challenge has obviously been in the implementation of this because um, for approaches that have not been inclusive enough, especially with the uh, private sector or um, um, even citizens who are very important in, important in, in these laws, um, there's always a challenge in implementation because they're set up and unfortunately, after they've been put in place is when they now put an office that is supposed to come up with implementation plan for these laws, which, I mean, it's always a challenge. You don't have local expertise, for instance. You don't have adequate resources for these offices. You don't have um, uh, stakeholders buy in on, on this uh, uh, on implementation. And citizens are not adequately informed about uh, either the, the um, consequences of not following these laws, uh, price, I think cost is a big issue for, especially for businesses, for instance, that have to comply with, with, with these laws. And most people don't even understand what is happening. So um, in, in East Africa, there's this uh, culture where we, people write their, all their details, uh, biodata information in, at the doors, when they get into buildings, you write your name, your full you know, names, and then you write your, your national ID number, and then you write your, um, if it's a car, you write your registration plate, uh, and then you write your, uh, the time you got there, you write your, and then your signature, your official signature. So if I walk in, I can see your, your signature, I can take a picture of that, I can take a picture of your ID, um, your ID number, I can know your registration plate. And even in, in countries, I don't want to mention names here, but there are countries where you can literally check their registration plate and find all my information on a government website, which is very, I mean, considering, so sorry about the, the noise in my background, um, it, it, which is unfortunate because um, especially governments that are putting these laws in place, they should at least from government side comply. And so because of lack of you know, multi-stakeholder engagement in drafting, not just in the 
you know, in the implementation phase, in the drafting phase, then it becomes a big challenge on buying and, and compliance issues. So an example right. I have seen in um, well, the actually, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start you right there just because I want to make sure we get to the other, but you'll have another chance to bring this back up. But yeah, I mean, so I think that's a really key point. You know, you've given us a couple of different fields where there's this, uh, you know, urge to develop policy. It sounds like in the, in the cases you're coming, it's like, oh, the government's like, oh, we need to do it. And then it's implemented. People are given the task, but then it's the drafting part that you really want to emphasize there. Um, I now want to turn to Olga. Uh, you know, what have you seen? What are you seeing? Uh, we heard, just heard, you know, from Marushka about the challenges in, in Latin America, from Sheila in, in Kenya. What are you seeing in the Eastern European space around this type of uh, push and you know I think also coming back to that question of you know leveling up are we are we going are we leveling up to human rights standards or are we actually going to lowest common denominator and decreasing human rights overall Olga thank you Daniel um, I must say this is a bit strange feeling you know to be participating on site with uh, no one else from the panel being around uh, uh, so maybe the new reality, who knows, uh, but uh, happy to be here with you on uh, this panel and uh, I actually wanted to point out uh, that uh, current discussion uh, around uh, localizing digital policies uh, is uh, uh, probably from my perspective is uh, a continuation of what uh, we used to call uh, before a digital sovereignty, but uh, maybe uh, wrapped up uh, in a bit uh, better cover and uh, better promoted uh, by the states uh, around the world because uh, when before we were talking about to the digital sovereignty. This was uh, mostly coming uh, from the autocratic states, and uh, this is why this is uh, it was criticized uh, a lot uh, that uh, this is going against the human rights, that uh, this uh, will lead to violations and uh, restrictions uh, of uh, human rights. But uh, nowadays we see that uh, more and more democratic uh, states are actually talking about uh, localizing digital policies. And uh, interesting example which uh, comes here to my mind is uh, the uh, European Union and uh, its uh, policies to, to localize in uh, various fields of uh, uh, digital ecosystem uh, their regulation. And uh, of course, uh, no one uh, dares to criticize uh, these uh, movements because first of all, they offer indeed a high quality standard of, uh, for the protection of uh, personal, data, uh, personal data privacy. Uh, and uh, they also try to show that uh, they are a powerful actor in this uh, whole uh, internet governance uh, ecosystem because uh, let's say they don't have uh, that, uh, they are not producing in the technology as China does. Uh, they uh, do not have those uh, big uh, tech companies as uh, the United States, but uh, what they are trying to do is uh, to introduce policies and uh, by that way to say that uh, we are also a powerful actor in, uh, in this uh, whole uh, ecosystem. So uh, I think that the GDPR is a good example of actually localizing uh, digital policies uh, and um, it's a positive example because, uh, as I said, it offers a high standard of uh, protection, but uh, also uh, many states are trying to actually uh, copy this uh, uh, this level of protection, and uh, uh, it uh, would not be the exaggeration to say that uh, what uh, states, uh, uh, neighboring states to the European Union are trying to do, they just uh, copy pasting uh, those uh, standards into the national uh, legislation, uh, not only because it's considered one of the highest and the best data protection standards, for example, but uh, also because uh, uh, they uh, need also to ensure this uh, free and smooth flow of data across uh, the borders. But with the localization of uh, policies, we of course uh, come to this uh, inevitable conflict of uh, laws and jurisdictions uh, uh, because we still uh, lack this uh, legal interoperability when it comes to internet uh, and uh, to digital technologies. And uh, the more we will go into this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, making it down and down and down to, to national level, uh, the more complicated uh, it would get. Uh, and uh, in any case, uh, we need to make sure that what is uh, being um, that what is being nowadays introduced as uh, localization of digital policies that they that they still uh, are human rights uh, oriented, uh, and uh, we still need uh, to talk more about uh, cooperation between uh, the states and between between uh, different uh, stakeholders in an attempt to still have the universal uh, standards which would uh, ensure the high level of uh, protection of uh, digital rights that I would stop here for this first intervention. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Olga. I mean, that's, there's a really a lot there. It's really fascinating what you've brought up about, you know, uh, 
whether localization is just digital sovereignty repackaged or whether it is substantively different and responds to different needs in a different environment. And that actually, I'm going to kind of uh, pass the, 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 the baton to you, Richard, uh, with that question in mind also. You know, um, what examples uh, have you seen of this? And then also in, in light of uh, what uh, Olga has just said about potentially some of the pitfalls of localizing in a way that doesn't um, uphold uh, global human rights standards. Great, thanks, Daniel. And really lovely to, to be here virtually, if, if not physically with you all. I think before I start, I would, I think it's important to remember that, of course, when we talk about these issues, there are almost 3 billion people in the world who still don't have access to the internet. Um, and we really shouldn't try to be solving many of the problems that we are trying to solve without always bearing in mind the need to make sure that those 3 billion people are connected as soon as possible, because otherwise we are going to further increase a number of digital and other societal divides, um, which are only going to cause more problems. But moving on to your, your specific question, I think I take a, a sort of a similar understanding of the way things have developed to Olga. It is incredibly difficult to get governments around the world to agree on anything. And we know that the internet and technology is a global issue, but we look at other global issues, for example, uh, environment and climate change, uh, terrorism. Uh, these are also big global issues that need international cooperation, but, but you only need to see the challenges that we've seen at COP26 recently, or the inability for governments to agree a definition of terrorism to, to realize that this is going to be a very difficult task and of course, tech policy moves even faster than those issues to an extent. So I think what you have seen is with governments feeling frustrated at the inability to reach global solutions or global standards on many of these issues, they're simply not waiting and they're starting to legislate domestically because many of the issues that are pressing, concerns around privacy and data protection, around the risks of hate speech and disin disinformation on platforms that Marushka mentioned, there isn't time to wait for a global standard to be developed and governments need to serve the interests of their citizens now. So while there are some exceptions to that general approach, I think, for example, data protection is one example where we do have, through a number of legal instruments, a relatively consistent global standard of what data protection should look like on some of the newer issues, for example, platform regulation, dealing with disinformation, uh, taxation, uh, regulation of AI and robotics. We don't have that. And so we're seeing almost a kind of um, I believe in, in sort of in the states, you look at the sort of laboratory of the states of 50 different states experimenting with different different solutions. And I think we're seeing that around the world at the moment with different approaches to many of these issues. The concern, of course, is one, that those solutions are often not human rights compatible themselves. There are some big concerns around new forms of platform regulation and digital taxation on users, for example, social media taxes that are excluding people or making it more difficult for people to express themselves freely online. We're seeing um, uh, forms of sort of uh, mandatory surveillance being introduced in some of the new forms of platform regulation uh, and a great degree of control over what people are saying and doing online. So, but there's also a second issue, which is that even if we have human rights compatible national frameworks, if they're not consistent with each other, it risks fragmentation and we risk making it difficult for companies to operate in mul multiple jurisdictions. And that will only leave the biggest actors and players left because only they will have the resources to be able to comply with hundreds of different national frameworks. So we will end up with an internet, which is just Facebook, Google and Twitter. And I don't think that's good for, for anybody. So I think we also really need to bear in mind that national frameworks are important. They must be human rights respecting, but we really must encourage harmonization as much as possible so that the sort of the benefits of a global interoperable internet aren't, aren't lost. Great, thank you, Richard. I think you really, you know, hit the nail on the head. The the, the the difficult balancing act that is taking place right now between harmonization, upholding human rights standards, and responding to what are sometimes urgent needs that can't can't wait. Um, I want to turn back now to Marushka, you know, because as a you know, uh, as a in your position, you obviously are responding to the the urgent needs of of citizens in Peru and. You know some of what you mentioned talked about that. I just wanted to talk about this multi-stakeholder um, component that you also mentioned. And you know, I believe Peru incorporates this approach in policymaking. But maybe you could talk about you know is that true? And then how do you do it? Which is maybe the more interesting issue around these issues. 
Um, well, um, the impact of the multi-stakeholder approach uh, to regulating the challenges of internet governance and the digital economy too, can be measured, I think, in the country's development indicators. Uh, this means that if we make wrong decisions in the digital economy regulation, we can undermine the competitiveness and the social development of our families. Uh, also, if we wrongly regulate the internet uh, governance, we can in undermine the freedom of expression, human rights, and the democracy. Uh, as nations move from non-regulation to uh, active regulation of internet and related technologies, there is an increasing need to harmonize the different perspectives around it. This ecosystem of technologies on which the internet depends has evolved over time to maintain the improve, improve the security, stability, and uh, resilience of the internet. The governance uh, of this ecosystem as, is an international issue uh, with implication for all. We also believe that the technical management and governance of the internet should not be only under government, government control. In fact, it, it is a priority for us to keep supporting and improve capacities for all stakeholders in order to promote this kind of mechanism. In the case of Peru, we have had various bills applied to internet governance and digital economy that have been uh, that have been born without this approach. In these cases, we have been working with the Congress, civil society, private sector, academia, regional and local governments, and with the citizens in order to focus the design of policy uh, of digital policy in territory data coverage of the real citizen needs and the opportunities offered by the digital world. In this sense, uh, at the beginning of 2020 uh, in Peru was approved a law that established the multi-stakeholder approach as guidance uh, principle of the national digital transformation process. As I mentioned, the actual Peruvian general government policy has included an, an access to digital transformation of the country with equity. In the first, is the, it is the first time that this topic has been added to a general government policy. This is the provide the, to this kind of discussion the relevance that they need. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Marushka. You know, I think. Um, you know, what you're talking about is kind of what are, are seem to be really interesting innovations within Peru around incorporating multi-stakeholder um, uh, processes within this real strong government commitment to a, a digital transformation, I think are really fascinating. And I think it, it, it also is kind of combines with something that Sheila was saying before, and I'm going to turn to you, Sheila, now to talk about, you know, you're, you were saying, it's it's in the drafting that's really important and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit because it's not just uh oh we've we've done it we've, this is it this is the final thing now go get civil society to like you know help make it work right it's about like having that multi-stakeholder model incorporated from the get-go which is what marushka was also saying so i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and then maybe you could share with us the example that um, you, you wanted to about how this process worked in action. I would also just say, you know, what if, what if, you know, this is a broader question, but what happens if uh, a multi-stakeholder process doesn't lead to something that upholds human rights or, you know, I mean, cause you could accidentally do that even, let alone, in, you know, intentionally. So uh, Sheila, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I think the, you know, uh, policy drafting uh, needs to be decentralized because I think for the longest time, it's been um, only focused on, on experts um, in, in the assumption that the people that this policy will affect uh, are not well informed to be able to even give suggestions around what should be, should be drafted. So the content of the policy is, is, is important as well as when it becomes a law. And, and, and that's why I feel in the drafting, in the drafting phase, there needs to be multi-stakeholder engagement as well, not just you know in public participation, because the, the, the approach has always been, we write it, you read it, you give us recommendation, we see if it's fit enough to be included in what we wrote, and then we see if we will pass it. 
But what if we look at it the other way around where we come to you and discuss the challenges that are there in the in your industry, for instance, in business? What is it that you know businesses are facing? Um, you know, at national level, but also at global level. For instance, with the introduction of digital taxes that only big corporations can pay. Why is it that they cannot involve, you know, uh, startups and, and SMEs and small businesses in understanding what are some of the challenges and barriers that you're facing in your business environment in this country? And how can we help uh, create a better business environment for you to operate locally? but also for you to scale regionally or globally in a fairly and competitive environment. The, the challenge with, um, with uh, not having the right people in the room is you can have those big corporations who can lobby and work with government and then create those you know, uh, inefficiencies that you're talking about or you know, going even against human rights where they make sure that the laws that are put in place would only favor them. But if you involve all the stakeholders, I mean, if it's, it's uh, um, a policy, for instance, that affects children in education, why can't we have children not draft the law, but talk about the challenges they face in school? And then the policies that will be drafted will incorporate some of those challenges. So I've seen this work in, um, in business, for instance, in startup apps. Uh, I've been involved in a number of them across the continent where businesses are starting to say, wait, if you're not in the table, then when the policies have already been passed, there's nothing we can do. It's now implementation phase, there's, it cannot be changed. It's already law, it's already law. So I think that, um, I don't know if you could call it uh, community centric approach to policy drafting, or if you could call it stakeholder driven policy drafting process, I think is, is very important because and, and not just at you know at, at, at local level, also including the, the stakeholders who are international who either have experienced this in, in their different countries, but also proper analysis of what is happening globally for that harmonization that we've been talking about. Because while it's great to have policies that are you know, very local, but what if it creates barrier for even your people to scale outside of the country? So I think with Startup Act, it's looking at what are the opportunities that are there for the businesses locally, looking at what are the opportunities to help these businesses work globally, but what opportunities can we create also for other businesses to be able to operate in, in these environments that we work in? And I feel in, in, the, in, in this digital space that we work in, that approach is, is quite needed because I think we, we've seen this with, for instance, with surveillance, we've seen this with their countries, especially in, in this continent in Africa where governments have locked out people from you know, um, operating their own accounts because they introduce exuberant social media taxes. They have banned specific social media platform because they assume people are using this platform to criticize government or to lobby because it, social media has been really instrumental in, in uh, civil society movement across the continent. And so governments are starting to be a bit more panicky around allowing people to express themselves online or you know, organize themselves online to be able to do this. So I think things like this, in essence, create barriers. And so if there's you know, stakeholder engagement in, in drafting and understanding the barriers and, and what better environment governments can use to create, um, you know, better environment governments can, can use to create policies that favor digital citizens, I think it will be important. Great, thank you, Sheila. Olga, I wanna I turn back to you, uh, and it's still this question of multi-stakeholderism um, and in, in, in the region that you work in, you know, you mentioned previously GDPR and, you know, perhaps maybe we've made progress globally on data protection, um, but what are your thoughts on um, the, uh, how multi-stakeholderism has been incorporated in, into some of the examples that you think about from your line of work and what that means, this tension between expertise and grassroots stakeholder engagement? Uh, thank you, Danielle. Very important question. And uh, I think uh, it is especially important to 
uh, develop uh, the local policies uh, in the digital sphere in the multi-stakeholder manner. Yes, we overuse this word uh, too often in the internet governance field and uh, it has become the buzzword, uh, but uh, still it is very important to bring all stakeholders on board when we are talking uh, about uh, shaping digital policies because uh, it is uh, well known that uh, we can have uh, perfectly drafted uh, laws, but it also depends on how those laws are being uh, enforced and uh, how they are being used by those in power against uh, the people uh, as uh, at the drafting stage it is always about uh, national interests about protecting citizens about uh, providing uh, higher human rights standards but uh, then in practice uh, things can uh, often go wrong this is why it is so important to have all stakeholders for this check and balances uh, exercise and i think there was a very good question also in the zoom chat regarding whether localization of uh, digital policies uh, uh, should entail capacity building for civil society organizations and uh, i think it uh, it is very important for civil society to actually build this capacity, but uh, there would never be someone uh, else to come to civil society and uh, to tell them uh, that uh, we want to help you to build your capacity so that, especially from the government, that we want you further on to be able to check whether we are doing all the things right. So uh, I think it's very important for civil society to actually catch up with what is happening and to be able to provide this, uh, not only thematic expertise, but also to make sure that they are a part of the discussion that they are sitting uh, around the same table so that they do not only come uh, afterwards when the policy is already in place. And this is how it often happens uh, in uh, many countries. Uh, it's very important to be part of the discussions uh, since the very beginning when this, uh, when the idea about some digital policy just uh, is in the air and is still being discussed and it still can be shaped and uh, influenced. Uh, and uh, probably we we all see that uh, these um, um, platforms like uh, IGF, they might not uh, directly lead to some practical uh, results, they might not lead to some decisions uh, being taken, but uh, at the end, at least we can sensitize the issues and uh, maybe the problem which was not uh, so visible at uh, the local level can be uh, can be brought to attention uh, at this type of uh, events and then later on again taken to, to regional or local national level and uh, then uh, they are discussed uh, between uh, between relevant stakeholders because sometimes we see examples uh, that uh, governmental representative civil society um, uh, participants they are coming to to IGF but this is probably the first time they uh, they meet each other so uh, that's a good starting point to take the discussion uh, from here and uh, further work on some uh, specific uh, regulations. Great, thank you, Olga. Richard, you know you mentioned. Um, and, and I know you've done some work on the, kind of this space and around platform regulation and what does that look like? And it's, a, you know, in, in some ways, it's a very global discussion that we see in the headlines every day, you know, around hate speech, around economic, I mean, everything, right? And so this is, um, I guess my question is, you know, what do you see the role of multi-stakeholder engagement in that debate, especially one being so global? Do you think it's happening at all? Are there places where it is happening? Is it largely not happening? Just, you know, because um, in some ways we're still at that phase where, well, it is being localized. I mean, countries are passing so a lot. So what, what's your take on that in, in the, the specific area of platform regulation? Yeah, um, it certainly is a, a, a good question and it's, a, and it's a huge issue. And I think it's one that has really taken off even just in the last couple of years, I think five years ago, the idea that we'd be regulating the platforms was still quite a niche idea, um, but things have changed dramatically. One of the challenges there is that you're seeing very different approaches to platform regulation in different parts of the world. So you see some places like the, the, the EU, which is looking at sort of all internet platforms at a systems and processes level. But in some parts of the world, you're seeing a focus on particular types of content, for example, hate speech or disinformation. Um, in other parts of the world, you're seeing uh, taxation as a way of addressing some of the, the, the issues or competition law as a way of challenging uh, the role of platforms. So there isn't a single kind of model of, of platform regulation itself. I think it is in some ways an interesting area for multi-stakeholder collaboration because inevitably it requires at least the private sector to be involved. It would be, you know, generally if we're looking at regulation, government is there, but if you're regulating the companies themselves, and they are for the most part companies, uh, they also are inevitably part of the conversation, whether they're invited or whether they're, you know, effectively lobbying. And in, in some ways, I think ultimately the chat, the issue is that the platform regulation is not just regulating the platforms, but regulating the users. 
It's regulating what we can do on the internet. It's regulating what we see, what we can say, how information is curated, how we're able to communicate with others. So in many ways, that stakeholder group of the individuals, the citizens, often represented by civil society is particularly critical. There are different approaches that have been more or less successful. I think one really interesting example recently um, that has genuinely been multi-stakeholder is the work that the OECD has been doing to develop a, a framework for transparency reporting relating to terrorist and violent extremism. So this is a piece of work that came out of the, the uh, terrorist attacks in Christchurch in New Zealand and the Christchurch call that followed. And the OECD has tried to develop a framework to encourage and enhance the level of transparency by platforms as to issues relating to terrorism and violent extremism on their platforms. The OECD brought together government representatives, uh, platforms, academics, and civil society groups. And, and I was involved in that work. And over a year, we were able to develop something which probably didn't satisfy everybody, but was something that we could all agree on would be an effective starting point. So I think that's been quite a good, a good example of a multi-stakeholder process. But as I've been hearing in other channels and other platforms, or rather other sessions uh, during the IGF, Multi-stakeholder processes genuinely need to be open, inclusive and transparent. It's not enough to just say, oh, civil society can participate, but they need to be able to, to sort of meaningfully engage and inform decisions, not necessarily take them, but to inform them and share that expertise. And that will often mean creating spaces and an environment that that is possible. And that might mean supporting financial resources, building capacity to understand issues, uh, building an understanding of how to engage in newly established uh, processes or structures that are looking at some of these issues and I think that's often where, where the, sort of the big challenge is is that processes will say we're made multi-stakeholder in the same way that you know the joke goes that, that everybody can go to the Ritz you know it's open to everyone but in practice it's not if you don't have the know-how and the resources to be able to do so so it's that part that I think you know really needs to be focusing on and, and making multi-stakeholder processes meaningful rather than just in name only. Great thank you thank you so much. Um, I think we should, I'd like to open it up to, to questions. So we do have about 15 minutes. I, I do see that there are um, some people in the queue in, in actually in Poland and there may be some other people online. Um, Morgan, do, can you give us a couple of questions? Sure, thank you, Daniel. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. I'll first begin by calling on Aiden who is located in Poland. Aiden, if you could please briefly introduce yourself and then ask your question, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I'll just check that you can hear me okay. Perfect. Yes, yep. we can. Well, thank you for an excellent session today. I have been learning a lot. So I really appreciate everything that you've been discussing. I think my question is probably best directed towards Sheila, but of course, anyone may answer it. So Sheila, you were talking about the need to decentralize the policy drafting process and the importance of stakeholder-driven policy processes. And I was wondering what you thought about, how do we engage a wider breadth of non-digital rights stakeholders in these discussions? Because I'm thinking about areas like agriculture, just because you don't participate in discussions around the Internet of Things does not mean you are not impacted by, say, precision agriculture that is going to impact your future wealth and your country's future wealth. And yet it's really hard to comprehend these trade-offs sometimes because you know, there are so many more pressing issues both in your country and in your region and globally than something that seems so far off. So I'm wondering, and I know it's such a vague <laughs> question, but... How do we ensure that all of the voices that need to be in these conversations are resourced to be able to participate and understand the importance of participating in these conversations and that their governments who themselves are so under-resourced are aware of the discussions that are happening, say at the WTO, WTO on these issues? Thank you. Thank you, Aiden. That's a really, really good question. Um, and. I'll give you an example of a um, startup act pro uh, process that we did in, in, in Kenya. Um, I think for the longest time, that process has been driven by government and that's why they only do public participation. So whether you, you want to participate or not, that's your problem. Um, but, but what happens if it's now driven by the stakeholders in the, in the industry? So what we did for instance with the startup act was it was driven by ecosystem players, the startups themselves. So you mobilize communities within your area 
So we, we, it depends with, for instance, in, in, in Kenya, we have pharma groups. So we'll have regional pharma groups. So they normally have um, leaders in those pharma groups. They're, they're like cooperatives. I don't know if that's what you also call them. So they're pharma groups and, and they normally meet to just discuss different things, could be fertilizer, um, uh, prices, availability of market, if there's a, an outbreak, things like that, and just share tools and, and whatnot. So within those pharma groups, you have to have those discussions at that level. So we say, for instance, we want government to, to reduce maybe tax on, on inputs, on farming inputs, or whatever it is that the farmers are facing, or whatever it is that the industry players are facing in that particular industry. And then they, they consolidate these different pieces. Um, the only challenge that you normally have with this process is you have to have a champion, if I can call them that, within government who will sponsor that process, not financially, but to ensure because we cannot take the, the draft ourselves as, as citizens to, to parliament. It could be a citizen bill, but we cannot physically take it there. So it has to have someone who's championing it and then look for stakeholders, leaders. So those pharma group leaders, uh, private sector leaders who can then now mobilize those conversations. And so we discuss the different components. What are some of the challenges we're facing that we feel, especially at national level? There are some that are very specifically, you know, very granular to, to your local region that might not be included, obviously, in the law, but there are those that affect the wider group. So I think it has to start from that point. Having community or, you know, groups or, you know, I don't know what you can call them, but at that level for them to participate. Um, but also there's a, a third component of people we normally forget, people in diaspora, for instance, who come from these countries that are never involved in these discussions, but it affects them because some of them have farms here, some of them have businesses here. And so even in the digital space, with our approach, we had to have sessions with, you know, people in the digital space who, via Zoom, and I think now uh, this is one of the, the positive, I think, uh, uh, effects of, of what we're going through with the pandemic is a lot of people have come online and so you can still have those sessions and then consolidate everything that you have to create a more comprehensive, and you will see a lot of synergies and similarities in, in these suggestions, but those conversations have to happen in person in those smaller groups in the villages in the counties for the consolidation to happen. Great, thank you, Sheila. And thank you, uh, Aiden, for a really great question. I think it also goes back to kind of what Richard reminded us about the importance of including more people. There are so many people who are unconnected, but really we wanna build digital policies that are inclusive of those people. I actually wanna um, ask something from Arushka because I think this is something that you know she brought up before, like, you know, um, in a country with a lot of different populations and different contexts, not all of them are digital natives, let's say. So, you know, what are your recommendations for engaging in citizens and other stakeholders in these types of conversations? Um, in the same line of Sheila, uh, I believe that we could consider a um, fourth general recommendation. First is um, to keep a permanently open digital challenge to the opinion of the citizens. Uh, in Peru, we have the Particip Participa, Participa Peru platform through which citizens can give an opinion anytime on various matters, but in particular um, of the progress of national policies and strategy in the digital environment. Second could be the promote of open innovation and citizen innovation spaces through innovation labs, such as Peruvian a Digital Transformation Lab, that allow citizens to be protagonists in solving problem, uh, public problems with the application of digital technologies and data. Third, what could be to establish other mechanism uh, or in, of interaction in addition, in addition to digital, such as telephone calls, in deep interviews, expert tables, and co-design session. And fourth is the permanent publication of open data that allows citizens surveillance, innovation, public sector accountability, proposals or evidence, and transparency towards the actors of a digital society. 
By incorporating citizens, we, ins we ensure that the solutions and policies that result from this interaction are safe from design and involves a multi-stakeholder approach from design. Um, an example in Peru, we are designing of our national digital transformation policy, the artificial intelligence national strategy and the digital talent national strategy, which were designed by a committee conforming a multi-stakeholder representative and public chat to for the opinion of the citizen in an open consultation process. Great, thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, those are kind of four kind of concrete things that can be done. I think oftentimes we talk about how to do that and having that, those experiences and those um, examples um, are, is really important. And it's really great to have a government participation here. Uh, and I'm just gonna read out a question that we have in the comments here uh, from Elizabeth uh, Sutherland. And it's, it's particularly for Richard. For civil society groups focused on local or national issues in their own country context, are there avenues for groups to learn about international issues and encourage the harmonization of tech policy discussed? And this one, I actually also, you know, I think for Richard, but I also you know, would love to hear Olga's perspective of this. And of course, any of our panelists can jump in. Thanks, yes. Uh, to answer your question, Elizabeth, directly, uh, the answer is yes, I think there are avenues and that's not to say that there aren't barriers or there aren't challenges, but there are. And of course we're in one of them right now, which is the IGF, which is which is one of the few genuinely multi-stakeholder processes, which as has been said, may not deliver outcomes or outputs, but brings together stakeholders on an equal basis to talk about concerns, issues, and to try to think about potential solutions. But there are other spaces, particularly where civil society groups can engage. And a couple that come to mind are the Global Network Initiative, uh, which is a collaboration of particularly um, ICT and uh, companies and telcos, academic civil society groups to come together to talk about some of the big concerns around privacy and free expression that relate to the actions of, of tech companies in different parts of the world. And the UN, and the UN is a big beast and some parts of it are more open than others, but a lot of the work that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is doing, some of the expert consultations um, that will be taking place next year, looking at issues like uh, technical standards or the role of businesses or the role of privacy in the digital age. These are all relatively straightforward processes for civil society organizations to engage in and, and, and to learn from. There is a huge sort of caveat to that. And I think one of the big concerns that I have is that when we talk about civil society and digital policy, we really often only mean digital rights groups. There is a huge broad uh, scope of civil society from racial justice groups to feminist organizations, children's rights groups, workers' rights groups who really are not part of this conversation as much as they should be because technology can seem off-putting or challenging. I think a big responsibility of those of us who, who support multi-stakeholderism is try to reach out beyond digital policy experts and digital rights groups and bring in other parts of civil society and make spaces like the IGF as interesting and welcoming to them as it is for those of us who, for whom digital policy is our day-to-day -day work. Great, thank you, Richard. Um, and Olga, you know, what did this, I think this harmonization issue is something that you've thought about too in the legal space, you know, kind of what does that mean? How do you expand? Uh, it, there's a, a, an expertise issue here as well, um, but also an inclusion component. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I wanted to say here that uh, for civil society, of course, uh, the IGF was already mentioned, but apart from the global IGF, there are also regional initiatives and uh, national initiatives where all these issues are also being uh, discussed uh, in a multi-stakeholder manner. I think nowadays with uh, a lot of uh, drawbacks that COVID brought to our life, it also made uh, some good thing uh, to all of us making available this online participation uh, to many people who before could not uh, join uh, in person or travel to far countries but uh, nowadays uh, it's uh, it's so much easier for and everyone is uh, it, if you, it has this better feeling of uh, being uh, on equal participating either remotely or on site. So nowadays it's so easy to connect uh, to that same rights corner, which is an excellent platform where the digital policies and the digital rights are being discussed. I also think it's important uh, for local stakeholders uh, to talk to international organizations, uh, representative offices uh, in their countries, and uh, also to connect uh, with uh, uh, the donors who are based uh, in their countries uh, to discuss this uh, digital agenda and uh, also to 
get to know about the possibilities of uh, funding for civil society uh, activities. Uh, I think the good example of uh, citizen participation, and probably some of you have heard of it, is um, uh, the project which is called uh, We the Internet uh, Global Citizens Dialogue, which uh, which is run by uh, a French-based organization uh, Mission Publics and. Um, uh, they have been uh, last year organizing uh, uh, these uh, national dialogues in over 100 countries uh, across the world. And uh, the idea was just to collect uh, uh, citizens' uh, perception of uh, the whole variety of digital uh, rights, about how they, uh, what they think about data protection, about privacy, about uh, uh, artificial intelligence in their lives. And just uh, uh, the idea was to gather together just ordinary citizens and uh, to understand what technology and uh, digital policy means uh, in their life. and. Uh, it's uh, to be honest uh, uh, it's uh, not uh, the um the responses that you would expect uh, from uh, the usual IG crowd, which you meet here at uh, IGFs, uh, because uh, uh, you might hear quite interesting and uh, fresh ideas uh, as these people uh, are not uh, usually uh, participating in such events and uh, they would just give you the perspective of uh, the ordinary uh, end users. And this is also important to understand whether at least those policies which are being discussed by us and by decision makers, whether they, would, uh, or whether they actually make sense for the target uh, local communities. And uh, I think for the civil society, for example, uh, we at uh, American Bar Association, we are working with uh, local organizations, uh, building their capacity on uh, internet freedom advocacy and uh, uh, helping to uh, connect, uh, to create uh, the network between these organizations uh, from different countries so that they can also share their experiences, learn from each other, but uh, also uh, develop some uh, joint actions uh, to strengthen their advocacy uh, activities. And uh, I think this is uh, what, uh, really matters to find uh, where you can be stronger together and uh, to work in that direction. Great, thank you, Olga. And I realize we only have four minutes left. We'll probably need to end on time. Um, but I do have one last question for our panelists, and I'm hoping that it can, you can answer relatively briefly. And that is just, you know, do you think the proliferation of digital law and policy is effectively raising the bar in terms of human rights adoption globally at the moment? So, you know, how are we, this is like a check in. How are we doing? Is, are, is it raising the bar? And uh, I'll, I'll start with Marushka. Um, I think the, the respect for the human rights around the world is definitely being impacted by the accelerating digital advance. Uh, in all aspects of people's life. Uh, uh, in this sense, it is essential that the international covenant around human rights be reviewed and re-inspired with a digital world perspective because the co these covenants were created in totally different situation. So uh, the only would like to add to close, um, adding that Peru is a strong supporter on an open, free, safe, and secure internet and advocates for policy, policy settings that support this decision. Thank you. Great, thank you, Marushka. Sheila. Um, I think it depends with the context and the content, but I think yes, um, because I think governments and individuals are being forced to be more aware about these things, um, either by law um, and being forced by law uh, to be deliberate around ensuring that this happens. So I believe we are we are improving, I think also using di different digital channels to push governments and, and ensuring that these rights, either locally or globally by other stakeholders, that they uphold the um, uh, digital rights. I think it's, um, it's it, it, yes, I would say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. We okay, great. Get there, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. Okay, we have two optimists so far. Olga, we have just a very short amount of time. As I said before, uh, the law in itself is not uh, a cure. It uh, depends uh, largely on the context. Uh, it uh, it can be ideal law, but it depends how it is implemented. And I would say it is uh, yes to your answer if uh, human rights are the center uh, of uh, and the focus of uh, that uh, digital uh, law and policy. But uh, if, uh, if it's not, if it's uh, just uh, the declaration, but in fact, uh, the implementation is so much different, uh, then uh, of course, it would not be helping to protect uh, uh, human rights uh, in, uh, in real life cases. Great, uh, you know, excellent point. There's what's on the paper and then there's what's actually in practice. It's also another level that we haven't even discussed here. 
but really great point. And Richard, where do you fall? Yeah, very briefly, yeah, I would agree with my panelists. It depends on the on the context and the particular policy issue. We're seeing advancements in some areas and, and weakening of human rights in others. But what I have seen is that there is almost no area where there aren't human rights experts and organizations who are demonstrating the impact that these policies are having on human rights. So human rights is very much part of the conversation, even if the responses aren't always wholly consistent with them. Great, thank you so much for your perspectives. I really want to thank the, the four uh, panelists, Marushka, Sheila, Olga, Richard. It's been a real pleasure to moderate this panel. I also want to uh, thank our um, the, the IGF support staff who have organized this hybrid event. I want to thank the people in Poland as well as the people who joined us online and the captioner who has been Ellen, who has been doing a great job capturing everything that we've said. Uh, a round of applause for, for all, all of the, the people who participated here. Um, it's been a, a real pleasure and I hope everyone has a really great rest of your IGF 2021 Poland experience. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Good, goodbye. Bye, thank you.